everyone. Uh, we'll just give it one more minute uh, just to allow some more people to join uh, and then we'll, we'll get started. Okay, uh, let's let's get started. Um, so thank you so much everyone for uh, attending uh, the first webinar in our three part series. Uh, this webinar is called the catch up with cancer movement. Can we stop the potential collapse of cancer care services following COVID? Uh, my name's Rebecca Lanham and I'm a solicitor in the medical negligence team uh, in the London office at Owen Mitchell. I also sit uh, within a specialist group at Owen Mitchell, um, which focuses on oncology. Uh, so I won't go into detail um, as I will leave this to our speakers, but just to provide some context for our webinar today. Um, and so as you'll all be aware, um, waiting lists for cancer treatment and problems within cancer services didn't start with COVID-19. Um, but the significant decline in cancer services appeared to begin following the pandemic. When NHS leaders and the government declared we were in the highest state of emergency due to COVID, the NHS did extraordinary things uh, to ensure that patients received the necessary care in the context of a novel pandemic. However, this has had a significant knock-on effect on other services um, and particularly in terms of cancer care which we're seeing now. Within our own practice as solicitors we've seen an increase in cancer cases and this has also given us cause for concern regarding patient safety and the state of services. So as part of the oncology group at Erwin Mitchell, we've decided to focus on this issue and as such are hosting a three-part webinar series with a name that's uh, consensually stolen from one of our speakers today, um, the Catch Up With Cancer Movement. This first webinar uh, introduces the series, uh, which focuses on the problems affecting cancer services, the effects on patient safety, and what can be done going forwards. Um, so thanks everyone that's submitted questions so far. Um, please do continue to submit questions throughout the session. Um, there's a Q&A function on your screen that you can submit them through and we'll try our best to answer them at the end. When you do submit questions, please do include your name and email address. So if we don't get to your question, we can respond directly to you after the event. Um, a recording of the webinar and copies of the slides will be sent out afterwards. And towards the end of the webinar, we'll be posting a feedback link. So please just take two minutes to let us know your feedback. Um, so we're very uh, fortunate to have two uh, very busy speakers uh, use their time to contribute to this webinar today. Uh, the first is uh, Professor Pat Price, who's a clinical oncologist. Um, I'm sure this is a topic that she could discuss for far longer, um, but she'll be talking for approximately 30 minutes today. And our second speaker is uh, Dr. Sonia Adesara, um, who works as a GP in London. Uh, she'll be discussing the state of cancer services now from her own experience as a GP and explaining what she feels can be done to improve services. 
she'll be speaking for approximately 15 minutes today. Um, both presenters have encouraged questions, so as I said, please do submit them. So just to introduce our first speaker, Pat Price, um, she's uh, worked as a clinical oncology consultant for 34 years. Uh, she's the chair of Radiotherapy UK and co-founder of the Global Coalition for Radiotherapy. M my colleagues may also recognise her um, because she's a well-known medical legal expert. Um, but most relevant for today, uh, she co-founded the Catch Up With Cancer campaign, which she'll tell you more about. Um, so I'll now hand over to uh, Pat Price. Thank you. Rebecca, thanks. And thanks uh, for inviting me. So um, I've been asked to talk about um, the problems with cancer. So yes, uh, we're going to talk today about our Catch Up With Cancer campaign. So next slide. So first of all, what is the current cancer crisis? Well, we've got delays in the NHS, we know that, the 7.8 million on the elective waiting list, but we've also got delays in cancer. And the importance for that is that we know from international literature for every four week delay in cancer treatment, there can be an up to 10% increase in risk of death. Now, obviously it varies between cancers, but it's time is critical for cancer. And we used to have it that you were, once you had your put on the cancer pathway or urgent referral, you needed to start your treatment in 62 days. And that graph there shows where we are at the moment, right back to 2009, we were ticking along at about right, about 85%. And you can see what's happened probably since 2013, gradually went down and it's fallen off a cliff with COVID. And the problem is it's now bobbing around about the 60%. So that means that four in 10 people do not get their cancer treatment on time. And there's even people who are out to th three months rather than two months. So this was written up. I wrote a, um, a sort of an essay piece in the Lancet uh, Oncology, which is our major international goal, about a year ago, summarising the problem. So that's the problem. And even last year alone, that means 70,000 patients waited over the recommended treatment time. And that means that they are at risk of um, not being cured of their cancer. OK, next slide. Next, sorry, next slide. Thank you. Right. OK, so how did it happen? Yes. <laughs> well, I think we start from if you, if you go on the right, this is our incidence rate and death rate for cancer. Now we have a OECD is that is basically the international measure of how people are doing internationally. And we knew even before we went into cancer, we were at the one of the bottom of the leagues of cancer survival. Now that's a mixture of things of we tend to in the UK present late. Uh, we uh, and also we tend to not be able to get on with treatment. So that was before obviously COVID, now things got even worse. So I'd say it was, there was a slow descent into the crisis that really hit the wall with COVID. Um, we don't diagnose early enough and then we don't treat enough. And that's really to do with a capacity issue. If we had no capacity issue, if like Sonia who's going to talk as a GP could order an ultrasound scan that next day if she wanted to do a one, then we'd all be diagnosed on time. Because remember a quarter of diagnosis of cancer in people that are not as suspected got cancer. And if we could treat everybody in France, if you had a breast lump and you were treated by the end of the week and had your surgery, that would be fine. But we don't. We have a capacity problem. So essentially we have to ration and prioritise patients. And then that means that we, when we have more cancer patients, we can't deal with that capacity. So we get the delays. It has deteriorated since 2010. That's partly also because the NHS changes with ulcerity. Perhaps it may be NHS England were brought in that, but obviously things have happened since 2010. As we all know, the NHS is not coping as well as it used to do. I think the concern was during COVID, cancer was not protected enough. As soon as the changes, the letter from the head of the NHS England came out on the 17th of March 2020, we remember it well, changing services quite rightly, we had to do a lot. But remember, a lot of that was because we don't have enough capacity. We didn't have enough capacities in ventilators. We didn't have enough capacity in A&E. So again, we had to change the health service. Uh, obviously, things that kept going were A&E and obstetrics. You can't stop those if you came off your motor 
a bike or, or having a baby cracked on. But cancer was not quite as prioritised as much as we hoped. That was partly because the data coming out of Wuhan was that patients with cancer um, did fared worse. So there was that concern, but we soon realised that they could get going. But it just cancer wasn't given that priority. There almost we think there should have been a sage for cancer to realise what would all these um, effects have on a knock on. And we started getting behind and then we've never caught up. The first um, we pushed and pushed and pushed. First letter we wrote to Matt Hancock was the 1st of April 2020. By October 2020, there was a committee set up to catch up with cancer. Um, the good and the great felt they could do it. And they told us from the NHS they would have caught up by March 21. Then it was March 22, uh, then it was March 23, and now it's March 24. And you can see from that graph earlier on, there's no way that's happening. So essentially, um, uh, we're not catching up. We did have a problem is that there was this sort of bit of a false dawn when there was word out from NHS that we were catching up with a 62 day backlog. But in fact, that wasn't the 62 day treatment target. That was actually just the patients who need to be diagnosed. So as you can see from the figures, it's not great. And next slide. Um, OK, and then so we're not in a great position at the moment, but the problem is sorry, it's going to get worse. And that's because we're going to have an increase in cancer um, rate in the population. Now, we know it used to be about 10 years ago when I gave talks, it's one in three people who get cancer. Now it's one in two. And the rate is increasing. That's partly because of age. As you get older, more risk of cancer. So an elderly population, but also it's our lifestyle. 23 percent of cancers are caused by our lifestyle, particularly obesity and alcohol. That's increasing. So CIUK reckon now that there's going to be a 30 percent increase in cancer cases by 2040. And so really, if we're not coping now, um, I don't know how we're going to cope. And then also we've got people, this four million people living with cancer. So this is a problem which we're not addressing and it's getting worse and worse and worse. We, uh, Sajid Javid, when he was health secretary, announced a war on cancer 600 days ago. Then the next secretary of state came in and says, we're going to not have a cancer plan. We're going to have a multiple disease um, plan. Some logic in that, um, but a lot of us feel that you've got to have a designated cancer plan. The WHO say that ca that um, countries that have a designated cancer plan that's auditable and measured do increase survival. So we're really pushing that back on the agenda because I think particularly to recover, because we've got to have a recovery plan, never mind a cancer plan. And we've got to get back to a real prioritisation of cancer. We do feel that, you know, in the Blair government days, quite frankly, cancer was prioritised. I'm not sure it is at the moment. We hear so much about the, the general waiting list. You know, I, I, I'm not the one to say we should have more focus on cancer, but I think we should have more focus on cancer. One in two of us are getting cancer. It's a big deal. And I think we're also up against it. As we know, the NHS is in crisis and it's unsustainable the way it's going. So dealing with the backlog and dealing with these increased cases, we've got to get a plan and really get a plan, plan quickly or else every day it goes on, we're getting into a worse situation. I know we had a question about, is that the same for England and other centres? I'd say Wales is probably in a slightly worse position. Northern Ireland has even worse statistics, perhaps because of they haven't had their government functioning well. Scotland is slightly better, but basically we're all in this together and this is all not very good. Next slide. Um, OK, so then how did I get what? Why, why am I involved in all this? Yes. Well, I think um, I think obviously before I've been having running a campaign to get more radiotherapy. And I'll, on the right of the slide there, you see that we knew radiotherapy, the three treatments of cancer, surgery, systemic treatment and radiotherapy. Radiotherapy is needed in 50 percent of cancer patients and involved in 40 percent of cures. It's been very neglected. And so we're actually only um, giving it in 24 to 27% of patients. That was a problem in itself, which we were campaigning for. So then COVID came along and because we ran the charity, it, within days of, within days of the lockdown, we had people phoning up, my operate, cancer operations just been canceled. I'm not told what to do. It was desperate. It was just so awful. And 
it, it was a difficult situation for everybody, you know, bad enough lockdown. Remember, we don't want to remember it, but we remember it. It was pretty bad at the time. But for poor cancer patients got caught up in this. It was a complete nightmare. So then um, we realised that then actually we'd have to start lobbying for cancer and radiotherapy, but cancer uh, was uh, quite important. Then um, uh, Deborah James approached us, she was doing a, you know, a bowel babe, uh, sadly now has passed away, but she approached us because she's doing a panorama program in the July of 2020, wanting cancer patients not to be the collateral of COVID, because she appreciated that cancer patients were being slightly forgotten in all this and and they needed to be back front and centre particularly as we knew within a couple of weeks that the Wuhan data was not as strong as we it should be and that you could get on and treat a lot of cancer patients and so we did the Panorama programme and then uh, we after that we set up the Catch Up With Cancer campaign and in my innocence I thought well okay we're only sort of three months behind we can get this right, but obviously COVID didn't quite work out as we all hoped, and um, it just got worse and worse. So sadly, the Catch Up With Cancer campaign is still running. Okay, so next slide. So I had to learn pretty quickly how to lobby, um, and that was a um, revelation in itself because it's been a big mission. I probably spend about 20 to 30 hours a week pro bono on this at the moment because it's so important and it's so desperate. Um, I think the main ways we've ha been advised and have to do is number one is public engagement. Secondly is media engagement. Third is political engagement and then to make sure we're absolutely data driven. I think that there's a lot of data around there and, and our role is partly to sort of get all this data together. So usually I'm fact perfect on you know what data i know and when happened what happened and what effect it had all over the place but and there's obviously a, a whole reasons we list there the workforce shortage the complexity of cancer care now lack of patient autonomy and knowledge about the cancers um, are actually in a younger age group as well which are economically uh, viable as well the insufficient capacity um, and we're not giving a right balance of mixtures of who shouts loudest gets the whatever. Um, and we are, as an NHS, struggling. So we've got a lot of data and then how do we put it into sort of um, lobbying activity? So next slide. In terms of the, um, sorry, next slide. Uh, no, so the Y slide before that. Um, uh, oh no, that is, is that, uh, no, the slide before that. Yeah, that's it, right. So public engagement, yeah, yeah. And the next slide, yeah, public engagement, right. Okay, so um, one of the tricks we had was to set up a change.org petition because that reaches the wider. So we, when I did that snip, so 387 people have signed up to that. That's, um, Kelly, who was actually fronting, I co-founded the campaign with her father and she was caught up in the COVID and sadly she's died and she's only 31. And so um, her father wanted her to sort of front this campaign here, which is why her picture's there. And really within the change.org petition, that gave us, uh, people could sign it and then we could set up a website. We've got on the website a tool that people can email their MPs to express their concern. We've got areas to share people's story. And then also we've got summaries of press coverage and this sort of thing. Just how do you keep a, a campaign alive? Also the supporters on that change.org, we contact them every now and again and they are supporting it. And, and they've written very moving things if you go on the site about their relatives or, or friends or themselves who've had problems as well. So um, we try and keep as much as we can of public engagement. I think remembering we have very, very little money for this, like almost nothing. And so how do you run a campaign on, on fresh air really? Uh, so next, next slide. Then we get um, the media and as I've worked out how to, um, we need media, we need. Now media, the media have actually been extremely nice to us because I think they appreciate it. And I've never felt that they've tried to catch us out and they've been very supportive about leading on our stories. 
Um, I found it quite difficult myself. We've had um, over 200 articles or appearances of the Catch Up With Cancer campaign. Some of you maybe have seen me. There's all sorts, especially in lockdown um, and now out of lockdown. And I think I've, I found it quite difficult myself. I'm not naturally somebody that comes forward. And I found certainly live media at the beginning of it. I used to say to people, I'd rather give birth to my children than to do this. But then you've got, I've got to think to myself, if you think this is bad doing this, um, it's worse for the cancer patients and I think as time's gone on I've been less of a low, lone voice and so now it's kind of accepted that there is a cancer problem so it's slightly easier but this has been and I must say the people in the media all sorts television internationally immediate have been very helpful and I think it's a really important way to keep the news for the patients in the limelight because there is so much obviously going on at the moment unless we're shouting out for our patients cancer is just going to fall back down the agenda and it would be an easy one to hide because as I say um, cancer bit you know it's you can easily look at a say an, an ambulance delay target you can go and film you know 20 ambulances standing outside the you know an A&E department but patients with cancer dying unnecessarily three or four years later nobody's filming them so it's important that we stand up for our patients so that's important so there's a big amount of uh, media uh, work next slide and then there's the political advocacy i was we were fortunate enough that prior to the campaign um, our charity Radiotherapy UK was secretariat to the all party parliamentary group for radiotherapy and Tim Farron is an extremely good um, sort of um, constituency MP. He really led, there's about nine all party parliamentary groups for cancer in parliament and he sort of corralled them all together and uh, sort of working in unison to actually make some points. So there's lots of political tools one can use, uh, manifestos, written questions, oral questions, early day motions, debate, ministerial meetings, that type of thing. So we've been really pushing this all the time. There's a, there's a debate Thursday in the Lords, there's one next Monday, all these areas where we try and get influence to get the message over. I think certainly the message is, is got over. Um, uh, you know, they. They certainly know my name, which they shouldn't, and I think they certainly know um, cancer is a problem. I think our problem is we've had six secretaries of state for health in the last two or three years. We've had nine cancer ministers in the last three or four years. So just when you feel that you said they've got the message or whatever, then somebody changes again. So that's and we've got a new secretary of state. She's come for the treasury, so perhaps they will be good. They, I must say. The MPs have been great. They, they have been great and the ministers great. I think obviously there's the problem about the government is separate from the NHS. So it's it's two messages in there. But I've everybody is really, really supportive. It's just a case of what priority is things given and how can we keep influencing and pushing this down? They are making inroads into cancer diagnostics and haven't put some money into there. But as we're saying, it's no good diagnosing people on time if then they're going into a treatment queue because they're still the end result is not having your treatment on time. That's what you need. Uh, next slide. So um, there is a House of Commons Select Committee. Uh, Steve Bryan is he's been very good with cancer as well, um, although he's leaving at the end of this parliament. And they did a very good report on the first session about cancer services um, and uh, in COVID and what has changed. And then the middle of the second session of the future of cancer care. So I must say they're very hardworking MPs doing a lot of work producing reports. They did produce this report, which showed lots of the problems, but unusually for a select committee report, the, the government took none of their recommendations. So um, they're hoping again with this futures will make some inroads. And I think again, it's just priorities and money because as they say, um, government have no money. Uh, next slide. So what we've done recently is uh, some of us have got together, 12 academics from 12 different universities have got together and said, OK, well, if nobody's getting a cancer plan, we'll give you a cancer plan. So we've published this last week. Interestingly, CRUK today published their cancer manifesto within that. A lot of it's research and that type of thing. But they do say we need a cancer plan. So they we're, we're talking in one, which is useful. But this is certainly an NHS blueprint for what we need to do. To looking about um, the whole spread, the prioritisation that's needed, the accountability, the leadership, all that type of thing. And hopefully that will go, so go, come where to say, look, how do we catch up with cancer? 
obviously difficulty is we're coming up to an election um, in the the budget nothing was announced for health um, in the uh, party conferences um, in September and October people were steering clear although the Liberal De Democrats bless them they did say about um, the 62 weight whether they should get that legally enforceable um, so uh, trouble is the NHS is a bit of a hot potato at the moment obviously you know bad enough trying to stop the boats or whatever they're trying to do but sort the NHS out <laughs> bit of a bit of a tough one um, but we press on um, so next slide uh, so um, this is just a question really will we <laughs> will we catch up with cancer <sighs> well I think um, the bottom is there cancer affects one in two of us and it's increasing i think we can't afford to not catch up with cancer and that's my message to them we we've got to do this the 62 day target is too poor to recover at the moment without a plan it won't just drift up on its own i think we need a radical rethink i really do think we need cross-party working because this needs a 10-year recovery plan it's no good if you're going to have six different health secretaries or a change of government or a, this time you've got to have some consistency here this is long-termism and so we're really calling for some cross-party working you know the nhs is difficult they'll probably need nhs reform as well because um how do we get out of this mess at the moment i think we are too there was a good itv program the other week which we did and there's a very good chief executive on from one of the trusts he was saying we're having we're sort of accepting poor care at the moment aren't we because it's you know there's so many things going wrong in the in the world as it were and then we're kind of thinking oh well the cancer weights are at 60 percent oh dear well no scream that's not okay you know that equals thousands of people are dying unnecessarily you know so let's do something about it i think um there is the current focus on the elective background and social care and fair enough they they're important areas too i'm not denying it um i think we need more accountability from people making the decisions um to say it'll be ready march 21 or oh, then march 22 march 23 you know come on somebody's got to say come on this isn't good enough get on with it i think we need to engage frontline staff as you know there's been a lot of talk about frontline staff you're told what to do as i say tired of being told what to do by people who don't know what to do and i think if you if we can do it if you engage the whole of the frontline staff and got them really going then we could we could do mountains so you see what we did in covid amazing and I think we need that COVID vaccine moment when Boris said, right, we're going to get a vaccine. I don't care what you do, cut through it, do it. We did it. We need that moment in cancer that says, I don't care what you do. We're just going to do it and get on with it. So I think that's what we need to do. So um, next slide. Um, so this is just a final thinking about what we can all do. I think the first thing is not to accept poor care. Let's say interesting the Liberal Dems to put in going to put in their manifesto a legal right to receive cancer care on time that would be interesting because in some ways sometimes legalities are only the things that help but obviously uh, we'll have to see i think the second thing is call it out and take a stand again there's a lot of problems with you can't speak up in the nhs or things but i think we've got to stand up for our patients and i think it's not okay and i think and obviously if people want to uh, support the catch up with cancer campaigns be put out on social media if you can retweet all this sort of thing sign that petition eat there's an email your mp function we've got a fundraising campaign or any corporate donations or anything like that we're running this absolutely on a, a nothing budget so anything it's a help but i think we've all got together to say cancer is really important and that we can do this but if we let it fall off the agenda it will just become that curve down at 60 percent will just be the normal and then over the years we get more cancer cases it'll just get worse and worse and we and where will we be then not in a great place so i wanted to close there and obviously um lead on to sonia thank you um so much um pat for that talk um and also just for all the work that you're actually doing um as part of this campaign i think you said you're spending 25 to 30 hours a week on this that is quite a significant amount of time um so uh it is you know that is very impressive um and clearly very important um it's certainly a worrying state of events that we're in um personally i had no idea that the statistics were now one in two people were likely to get cancer 
um, that's certainly another reason um, that there needs to be this drive to improve our cancer services. Um, I, I'll ask everyone to just continue to please submit um, submit your questions, and um, our speakers will will come to them at the end. Um, but now I move on to our second speaker, um, Dr. Sonia Adesara. Um, so Sonia works as a GP in London. She's therefore got first-hand experience of the ongoing pressures faced by our doctors on the front line. Um, and she is an activist for improving NHS healthcare um, and addressing health inequality. She's on the board of trustees for the charity MidAct, uh, which supports healthcare professionals in addressing the social determinants of health. Um, and she is the former co-chair of the Medical Women International Association, which is a global organisation advocating for women's health and the rights of women doctors. Her non-clinical work includes working for the national cancer charity Macmillan and the women's rights charity, the Fawcett Society. Um, so thanks very much for, for joining us, uh, Sonia. Um, over to you. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I'm afraid I don't have slides, so I'm just going to talk at you for 10 minutes um, and then we can answer questions. Um, so I thought I would just start with a case that we had in our clinic recently. So we had a gentleman who presented to our clinic and um, presented to one of my colleagues. Um, and this was last year and he presented to my colleagues with respiratory symptoms. He had a cough that wasn't getting any better. So my colleague referred him for a chest X-ray at the hospital. Um, the x-ray happened quite quickly because we have a walk-in service at our local hospital um, and the radiologist found on the x-ray a suspicious lesion so he was referred for a ct scan it was an internal referral that happened within the, within the hospital um, so it's something it was an urgent referral so it would have happened within two weeks so this gentleman he wasn't explained any of this he wasn't told what was on his x-ray he was just told that he was going to have a ct scan on the day he was supposed to have a CT scan, his appointment was cancelled um, and he was told that he'd receive a letter in the post with his new appointment. And um, he waited for that letter. Um, that letter never came. Um, and then earlier this year, and I think it was about sort of six to eight months later, um, he came back into his GP surgery. Um, his son brought him into the GP surgery. At this point, he was very sick. Um, one of my colleagues saw him. You know, looked at all, looked at what happened, looked at the X-ray, um, and I, I, I don't know what's happened to this gentleman, but i um, but I do know. <laughs> um, I know that his cancer would have progressed, and I, I can tell you that his chances of survival are now significantly reduced as a result. Now, I mention this case because, you know, I was introduced at the start of this as a GP, you know, and as an activist. Um, and I became an activist because I was increasingly seeing patients come to harm, um, not purely because of the misfortune of being sick, but because of failures of the system. And that's why I started to campaign. I started to campaign because I was concerned that I was increasingly seeing poor care, inadequate care, um, and that inadequate care tolerated and in some, in some parts of the NHS that inadequate care being normalised. And that normalisation or acceptance of poor care has occurred amongst NHS workers. And I, I believe that's a result of you know, increasingly being working in overstretched, under-resourced, understaffed environments. Um, but I also feel, and you know, Professor Price mentioned this, I also feel this acceptance of bad care is also occurring amongst the public as well. Um, my main area of campaigning is women's health. And you know, last week there was a, I don't know if you saw this, there was an, there was an article in the, in the news, a report that came out that showed that now two thirds of maternity services in this country have been rated, rated, rated not safe by CQC standards. Now, <laughs> that should be an, a national outrage. You know, from when I read that, I was like, oh my God, that's so bad. And yet it was just, it was just another story. And I think we're becoming, there's a real problem now that we have in this country that we are becoming, I think, immune to the statistics and the negative headlines that we're seeing among, amongst the NHS. But the second reason I mentioned this case is because um, we have had some amazing improvements in cancer care. Now, I used to work for Macmillan, the charity, and there's some, we are some amazing research, some amazing treatments. Cancer is a success story, but all of that is pointless if we can't get the basics right. So, for example, this gentleman, you know, he would have probably come back to us sooner 
had it been easier for him to get a GP appointment. And once people are getting referred to the GP, you know, getting referred by the GP to the hospital, as Professor Price mentioned, people are having to wait longer and longer for their appointments to see the oncologist or to see their hospital clinicians. We know from NHS England data that cancer waiting times this year are now the worst on the record, worst on recorded levels. And as Professor Price mentioned, delays diagnosis, delays to getting treatment, delay it will impact your prognosis but also increase your risk of living with morbidities and can increase your risk of dying from cancer. So research by Macmillan found that there are at least and probably more but at least 100,000 people in the UK who've had their lives put at risk over the past decade because of delays getting treatment or getting tested for cancer. Appointments are also getting cancelled increasingly due to staff shortages um, and often we see this a lot in GP. Patients don't just don't know what's happening. They don't know you know, they get told by their GP they've been referred to the hospital. They don't know if their referral has gone through. They don't know when their appointment will be. They don't know what the waiting times are. They don't know how long they should be waiting for that letter through the post. Um, you know, and, you know, they, they just, and they don't know when to contact the GP. And, you know, despite us, we're supposed to have a, you know, we're supposed to have a two week wait in this country. So that means you're supposed to be seen within two weeks. But Health England Watch, which is a committee of the CQC, found that one in seven patients who'd been referred to a specialist by their GP were still waiting after one month to, to, to know what the next steps were in that process. So, and then also, you know, we're seeing this a lot in GP, when, when patients don't get their letters or don't know what's happening, um, they just don't know what to do. They contact their GP, the GP tells them to contact the hospital, and then patients just get lost in this sort of like, just this administrative black hole of not knowing what to do. And I think we have this assumption, and for people who maybe don't work or don't live, don't work the NHS or don't, don't use the NHS, there's an assumption that we have this unified system because we have a national healthcare service. But actually, when people try to use the healthcare service, particularly if you have um, complex or multiple health needs, then often your experience is a complete opposite. And they find it really difficult to navigate the system and they find different parts of the system just don't communicate with each other properly. And this is particularly an issue, and this is an issue for the patient that I mentioned at the start, particularly an issue if English isn't your first language. Um, and we know, and I'm increasingly seeing this, that we're finding that people have to be, have to be pushy or have to be, you know, advocates to get proper care. Um, and that just shouldn't be the case. It's not fair and it's not right. Everyone deserves to have proper care in the NHS. So, um, so where do we go from here? Um, first of all, we have to get the basics right. Um, and secondly, I think we have to think about how we can do things differently. And yes, you know, as, as Professor Price has outlined, the, the pandemic has had a massive, massive impact on the NHS. Um, but there were also, there were some good things and some learning that we can also take from the pandemic as well. So yes, you know, I'm not going to repeat what Professor Price says, but investment investment is so important. We have to invest in people. That's in the recruitment of staff and retention of staff and the training of staff. We have to invest in equipment. You know, we can't we can't diagnose scan we can't diagnose cancers without scanners. I'm just going to have a sip of water. <clears throat> it's not COVID, but just cold. <laughs> um, and we, but we really, really have to invest in our digital infrastructure. So that's not just equipments, but that's our systems. So we have to ensure that our NHS is fully digitalized and fully integrated. And you know, it's ridiculous, but it's in 2023 right now, you know, people don't realize this, but our hospitals, our GP surgeries, our mental health services are all working on different systems that often struggle to communicate with each other. Um, but also, yes, there's learning from COVID. So like in, in primary care, for example, for many, many years, for decades, really, we've been talking about how should we, how can we do appointments differently? Um, but change never happened. But then when COVID came, suddenly we changed overnight. Suddenly we we're having telephone consults, video consults, text messaging services, virtual ward rounds. So we need to learn from this. We need to think about how do we create the conditions in the NHS where the NHS is able to embrace technology and where, where when there's good innovation happening in one part of the NHS, how we can share that learning rapidly throughout the NHS. Um, and there's also been, you know, there is some really exciting de developments happening in the med tech world, for example, which can not only improve care, but can also empower patients to take control of their care and their health. So again, we need to ensure making sure though how the NHS and particularly how NHS staff are motivated and supported to utilize this. 
life science is another sector that's growing in the UK and the AstraZeneca vaccine was a really good example of this. So, you know, we've got some amazing research institutions. If we invest in these institutions and also, if, you know, crucially, if we build up links and partnerships between these institutions and the NHS, then potentially the UK be could become global leaders in this. Thirdly, data. So data, because we have a national health service, we, we have a huge and rich amount of patient data. So if we have the correct legislative framework in place, which is important because who owns that data, which is, you know, it's our data, who owns that data, how that data is used is really important. But if we have that legislative framework in place, then that data can be used to really transform how we deliver care in this country. And um, so I'm, do you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist. I'm really optimistic about what we can do with healthcare in this country. But also, I think, you know, we have to be pragmatic. We're in a financially tight environment um, and the next government will also be inheriting that. So I think we have to be innovative as well. We have to think about different ways of how we can deliver care. And I'm just going to give you one example of, of, of one of these, of, of an innovative way of delivering care that happened recently. Some of you may be aware of this. So a couple of weeks ago in the news, um, you might have heard of the um, anastrozole, which is a breast cancer drug. It was, I think it was about two weeks ago, it came up in the news. So this is a drug, um, it was in the news because it was being licensed um, to be given to a particular group of women. Um, and if this drug was given to women, it could, it could prevent them getting breast cancer by up to 50%. So that's massive. Um, but the reason why this was a really exciting piece of news is that anastrozole is a drug that's been around for ages. Um, it's off patent, so it's cheap as, you know, cheap as chips. Um, and also, but we've, we've known about the benefit of anastrozole in preventing breast cancer for many years. And in 2014, the NICE National Institute of Clinical Excellence recommended it in prevention of breast cancer. But the reason why it hasn't been licensed in prevention is because because it's off patent, because it's cheap, there wasn't that um, incentive by, um, by um, pharmaceutical companies to push for it to be licensed in new ways because there wasn't that financial incentive. So here there was some learning that happened from COVID and I can, you know, after the q and I can talk about what that learning was, but because of what happened in the pandemic, um, a group, a, a programme was set up by NHS England in 2021 called the Medicines Repurposing Agency. So this was the first medicine to come out, out, come out, out of that agency, where, which essentially has pushed for this to be repurposed essentially relicensed in this way of prevention. So here we have a medicine that's extremely cheap and that will be preventing cancers in thousands of women. And we know that there's many other treatments and also cancer treatments that could be used in this way. So here's just you know, one example of, of how, you know, if we think innovatively and think about doing things different, differently, then we can improve care and save lives, you know, without a significant cost. And finally, um, you know, we, we have had some amazing improvements in cancer diagnosis, in cancer treatments, but an area which I really feel that we have failed in this country um, is prevention. So, you know, Professor Price mentioned this, we're increasingly seeing more cancers in younger patients. Um, we are seeing rates of cancer go up because of because of because we're not getting prevention properly. Um, and racial and economic inequality amongst cancers persists and is widening in some areas as well. So again, this requires us to be thinking innovatively, this requires us to be thinking about policies outside of the NHS, thinking about how we can get people to eat better, to move more, to live healthier lives, and how are we supporting our patients to do that. And to finish, you know, yes, Yes, you're all aware, you know, um, as in, particularly as medical negligence lawyers, you're aware the situation in our healthcare system is not good. Um, but I, I am a campaigner because I, I see the NHS doing amazing things every day. Um, and also there is a massive, there's massive potential for the NHS to do things better. And I think with the right thinking, with the right policies, with the right intention, then we can get things right. And I do believe, I do believe we can deliver world-class healthcare for everyone. And that's, you know, and that's because every patient and, you know, every one of your clients, every one of your families deserves that. We all deserve to have world-class healthcare. Um, and that's why I'm campaigning. And yes, you know, yes, things are not good, but things can get better. And I think, you know, if we, if we're working together for that, I do believe that we can deliver world-class healthcare for all in this country. That's all.
Sorry, I'm on mute. <laughs> um, thank you so much, uh, Sonia. Um, it's it's good to end on a on a hopeful point um, in um, what otherwise looks to be quite a unfortunately quite a bleak picture. Um, I thought in particular. Um, I didn't know about the medicine repurposing agency, um, if that's if that's what it's called. Um, that's that's really interesting um, in terms of um, a practical and perhaps lower cost solution um, that can assist in maybe catching up with cancer services. Um, so we've got a few questions, um, and. Um, I would encourage people to continue to submit them um, as we're talking. Um, so let's just I'll start with my, my own question. Um, I my um, because I'm interested in a few things that you've both said. Um, my impression, um, and this may be misguided, um, is that in some London hospitals, um, cancer services may run better and more efficiently um, than in hospitals in the rest of the country. Um, and obviously, Professor Price, you touched on this because you mentioned how poor um, services are um, in Wales and, and Northern Ireland. Um, if this is true, um, what more can be done to rebalance this so it's not a um, geographic lottery? No, good questions. And you're absolutely right. We've got a huge geographic lottery now. And that inequality is no good for anybody. And in some ways, how do you increase your cancer survival as a population? You improve the worst cancer survival. So it is as a target and it's right. I think it's a compounding thing. Areas of deprivation perhaps didn't have the most well funded uh, health services uh, they were they were sometimes hit by the worst covid and then they got behind the worst and then they're so it's doubling um the disadvantage of this so there's a massive imbalance now we've got the changes in the nhs so we have um icb so cancer is being taken out of the central commissioning which again some of us have concerns about because um like for instance just a straightforward thing like radiotherapy machines, which is a great imbalance. There's, there's machines that are out of date and hardly work in some places. And what you should have is the central rolling replacement program. If it's dissolved now down to trusts, then of course, if they're roofs leaking or if there's a queue down the road of um, you know ambulances, they've got to deal with those first. So I think this is only going to actually accentuate those inequalities. Um, and I think we've got to um, give everybody the right to best care. But yes, very patchy. And it was great. Some people get great care. And I'm not saying mm. they don't. Fantastic. But in some ways, we need to think about our most disadvantaged. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Sonia, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, we do have a postcode lottery, actually, not just in cancer care, but in, in a lot of hospital services. Um, and I think it's 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 partly how trusts receive their funding and also how they're penalised as well. Um, so I won't name the hospitals, but I can think of sort of, I guess, three hospitals in our in, in my area of where I work and also where I trained. Um, so there's one hospital that that it has a lot of attracts a lot of research um attracts a lot of funding with that delivers a really good service their junior doctors all have ipads given to them by the trust um, and then they're in this great cycle of just getting more and more money there's another hospital that's in a really poor poor part of you know sort of same area but actually in a really poor part of area much more deprived population and um, attracts less less sort of big you know big 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 research projects gets less funding often has higher clinical need and then often they will get penalised when things like they miss certain targets and they lose money and then they, and then they go, go down this financial sort of deteriorating spiral. Um, so I see that. So I know my area where I want my family to be treated and where I wouldn't want to be treated. So I think we just need to be quite honest and open about that and look at, look at hospital trusts where they're doing well and look at trusts which are not doing well and then adjust the funding appropriately rather than, rather than financially penalising trusts that are not doing well and then they get into this deteriorating um, path and the same with general practice as well there's certain you know there's certain gps that are not doing well certain areas are not doing well we should be supporting them rather than penalizing them for that um 
And, and yeah, I think we do really need to be thinking about as well, like the population of people and how that can impact the care that we can, that we can deliver and trust. Um, and areas which have high deprivation, making sure that those trusts and those areas are supported to do that. Uh, yeah, and I'd add that that's a really good point because you could argue that why are we running such an important, I think what COVID did teach us was that health is really, 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 really important for so many reasons, economically and all these sorts of things now. And it's almost like an existential thing. It should go above everything else, really. It's not a law and order thing. It's health is really fundamentally important. I'm not entirely sure why we got ourselves in our position within a public sector providing health where money is used as the stick to beat yeah. people. Yeah, I'll give you, I'll um, just give you. But yeah. no, I agree entirely, it's terrible. Yeah, I'll just give you an example so people can understand sort of on a basic level what happens. I remember when I, when I was a trainee working in A&E department, a very, very, really busy A&E department. And I remember one day the waiting times, we, it was all just red. So basically when patients come in, they're green. And then when they've been there for a few hours, they turn to amber and then they turn red when that means when they've been there for over four or five hours, that means I haven't seen anyone. So that the, the screens were all red. And I remember going up to our sort of our head nurse being like, what's going on? We need to shut the doors. We can't keep having A&E services come in, coming in because we're not seeing these patients within, you know, on time and it's becoming really, really unsafe. And she says, we can't, we can't do that. If we go on black alert, then the hospital gets fined. So they were not closing their doors, despite the fact that they weren't able to cope with the workload because of that fear of being fined. Now, but here's something to learn about COVID. When COVID happened, that changed. I don't know if it was, you know, what we, we, we had a different system in hospitals where they actually, the ambulance services were talking to each other and taking, they, were, they had a sort of a live tracker going on and taking patients to the, air, to the hospitals that you know had space. And that was done across London to think about how we can do things safely. So things like that, like sort of, let, you know, communication between trusts, is really, really important. Um, and that's a simple thing that can happen. That doesn't cost money, but it's just about better communication and trust, trust in areas working together rather than working against each other. Correct. Yeah, it sounds like also just cutting through some of the red tape, um, which kind of prevents that would also be very helpful. Um, so I will just move on to um, another question, uh, one we've just received. Um, so um what more can be done in terms of prevention considering that 80 percent of disease is preventable um especially uh, cancer such as cervical cancer um and um this uh, the person that's asked this question has suggested things like social media influencers tv ads inclusion into Hollyoaks scripts um just i suppose other methods of getting that message out there yeah, I, I, yeah, I completely agree with that because cervical cancer, that's a very good example because um, cervical cancer, we can either prevent it by using the HPV vaccination. Um, WHO say, I think the figures are to get it um, eradicated, as in with lots of vaccinations, I think you need 90% coverage. We're only at 80 to 85%, so we need increased coverage, but obviously then we've got an anti-vax thing going on, so that's impeding that but but nearly there but not quite enough and then also you've got your screening program cervical screening okay it's not nice having a cervical screen but we've got to um that rate is um only at so that should be 75 percent uh to, to get towards eradicating and it's only at 66 percent at the moment so we're not getting we got behind a little bit in covid as well and, and we didn't necessarily have a plan to how we would prioritize going forward because you can model that i think we're not i think there's just a lot of other things to do people aren't prioritizing it but it should be on every you know ladies toilet sort of back door it should be on some people are saying now it should be on clothes things i think we've just got we've got to be able to talk about these things and i think there's a fear of cancer we've got to be able to talk about talk about it openly people don't want to know and until we have that bigger national conversation we can't move all these things and anything like a soap stars and everything i think it's a really really good idea mm -hmm. to see the positive side of it sonia you'll have some good thoughts on this yeah i agree with all that and um, and particularly things like the cervical, cervical cancer and, and you know breast cancer screening we've also got to be thinking about what groups are not coming to screening and why um and is it certain communities you know are we using the right language are we talking to them in the right way are we talking to them through the right forums so you know someone like 
you know, my, my grandma, she, she won't be watching Hollyoaks, but she might be watching Indian TV programmes. So are we like thinking about different ways of reaching those certain groups of people? Because actually we know that there's certain groups of people who historically haven't been coming to screening and those are groups that we need to reach out to. Also another group that also get, often gets forgotten is people with learning learning um, learning needs or with, with disabilities, making sure that they, you know, they also get cancer. Um, so making sure that they're getting access to screening as well is really, really important. Um, but I guess with prevention, you know, there's one about that's preventable cancers. Yes, screening is one component. The other component about prevention is thinking about how we're helping people to live healthy lives, which we don't do very well in this country. Um, so, you know, you know, again, from COVID, you know, the reason why our death toll was so high wasn't just because of, you know, the, the response in the pandemic, but it, was, but it was because we had a very sick population going into the pandemic. You know, we were called the sick man of Europe because we have really high levels of health inequality. Um, and we have a high, you know, the, the, the age in this country of which people are living with illness or living with morbidity um, is quite high and it's high and it's particularly high amongst people in certain backgrounds and amongst deprived communities. So that's something that we really, really need to be thinking about. Um, and there was good thinking about that in, you know, under the last Labour government, under Gordon Brown, um, they had an initiative to reduce health inequality, which, which was done by Mark Marmot, which worked when it was put into place. Um, we need to get back into that, into that thinking, thinking about the policies that we need to improve the health of our, of our population and um, to prevent them from getting illnesses and cancers in the first place. And I think that connects to what um, you were saying, uh, Pat, because um, if it, well, it sounds like if, if we were if we were healthier, then um, the stats in terms of how many people are getting cancer would, would reduce and that in itself would relieve the pressure on cancer services. Um, but that um, sounds like it's a, you know, it's obviously a long term plan, which doesn't necessarily fit that well in with uh, how our governments are quite short term um, and as you say how every, everyone changes. Um. Yeah we've got to have this as a, an absolute mantra as they say if you're going down the wrong road it's never too late to turn back. Yeah. Um, so uh, we had another question um, someone uh, just for information um, uh, someone said, thank you very much for your very helpful insights and campaign, Pat. Is it possible to view the cancer plan you and your colleagues have created? Um, Pat's kindly given the link for that, so I'm happy to send that out afterwards. Oh, we've apparently already sent that link out, so that's great. Um, okay, um, we had a, um, we have another question. Um, so, um, which you, you've both touched upon already, um, but just to expand a bit further. So some NHS, NHS trusts have not yet digitised and this may slow down processes and delay referrals. Um, I think it's accepted that it does slow down processes and delay referrals by both of you. Um, what is being done to help encourage um, trusts um, and I suppose GP practices too to digitise? Sonia, you'll have some thoughts. Yeah. So actually, general practice has been um, to just we, we, ha we do have actually quite good systems in general practice um, and has been for a while. I think the problem is that they are different systems to what the hospitals are using. Um, so the, the, the systems are not connected. So we've got a really great system that we within us can use really well and we can do audits and we can do data and things. But then our system is completely different to our local hospital. It's completely different to the system that our ambulance service works. It's completely different to the, to the service that our mental health um, and to, and to the mental health services use. So this is, I think, the, the problem. The, the, for me, the biggest problem is a lack of integration between the different systems. Um, so ideally, we'd all be on, be on one system. Um, which is going to be a big task. Um, but I think the first task should be to do is try to really properly integrate our different systems. Um, and it is a big task and it is something that will cost a significant amount of money. But I really think this is an area that we have to invest in and it will save us money in the long term, save us from admin costs, save us from you know, the, the case that I showed, which was just a pure sort of administrative error um, to do that. Um, but even sort of like, you know, how do I explain the basics of this? Like, for example, if I'm referring to the hospital, I there's about four different ways I can 
refer to most people. Some is by email, some is by our online system, some is it's not using fax anymore, but it's the, the, the way that we're communicating is really, really old school. Um, and also like, let's say my, if my patient get seen by a hospital doctor, I will send them a letter, but they don't have access to all my notes. They don't know the journey. They don't know what's happened, which again is really bad for patient care. So I think better integration of our systems is really, really important. But ideally we should all be on one system. Now, um, again, under the last Labour government, there was this big push for, um, I don't know if you guys remember it, for a, 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 a digital system, which did work, but I think that we have to be pushing that for that again. Okay, Thank, thanks Sonia. Um, so um, we, we've run over already, but we'll just do one more question. Um, so um, Pat, you mentioned that um, there were other countries um, that had, um, you know, models for, they had cancer plans um, and it's potentially something that we could model ourselves on in the UK. Um, the question is, is uh, who does it better than the UK and how do they do it? Um, what can we learn from other countries and governments? Um, it's quite a big question. So. Yes. I think, yes, that would, I'll be very brief then. I think no, nothing's perfect. I think um, America, we don't want to go down that line. And yet at the same time, we can't say where we are. The European models uh, with insurances have their advantage, but they can go wrong. So I think there's a lot to learn. I do think it needs the Royal Commission to think about how we are running the NHS and what we need to do. And I think the issue is how do we get from where we are now to where we should be? And I think that we need a bit of a national conversation. I know the politicians are, are sort of screeching away from it, but I do think the general public realise that we're down a black hole here. And so I think everybody wants a solution. Um, and I don't like the polarization. It's, oh, well, we mustn't have an American system. Nobody wants that. But there is, there is a way of delivering a public, the NHS principles in a different way, because we, we can't start by trying to fix a 1950 system. We need to rethink what we want to do. And that will take some bigger beast than myself. But that's where we need to be, because ultimately we're not going to solve that problem until we solve that problem. Yeah, and just I just want to add something to this. Like you know, no, we don't want an American system, which seems very unfair. And you know, you, we all know the stories of people who just who are you know can't afford, won't go to the hospital because they can't afford the ambulances and the horrific things that happen over there. But increasingly, what I'm seeing, and I work in Tottenham, so it's not a wealthy area, but increasingly, what I'm seeing is that people who can afford to are paying to go private, um, because they are you know they're waiting months, sometimes years to get their treatments, to get their operation done, they're living with pain, their conditions are getting worse. So actually we are we're having a system that is becoming increasingly unequal and increasingly unfair due to deteriorating standards in the NHS. Um, so, you know, I, I wish our politicians would be a bit more bold about this, but I do think that, you know, the, the public, I think this is something that we always hear, public say we love the NHS, but people know that it needs to be better um, and, NHS workers who are working in the NHS know that things need to get better. So I think the public want it to get better. And I think it's just about pushing our politicians to do, as you know, Professor Price says, pushing them to do the right thing on this, because this is something we all will need the NHS at some point in lives. And then when we do need it, we do realise how important it is that it's there and that it's delivering good, timely care to us all. Um, so, yeah, I think my final note would be that we should all be supporting this campaign um, to catch up with cancer because it's really needed. Thank you. Um, I think we can all echo that. Um, it's been really, really interesting having you both um, talk and, and having these questions afterwards. Um, so thank you so much for, for giving your time today. Um, thanks to everyone that submitted questions. Um, you can still put them through the chat function um, and we can ask the speakers afterwards. Um, I'm afraid because we've already gone over, we don't have time to get to everything. Um, so. Um, We'll, we'll, we'll follow up with that. Um, we, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, this is the first webinar in a three-part series. Um, so um, we've got two more to follow. Um, the next webinar will be in ja end of January, beginning of February, 2024, um, and that will be on trials and treatment. Um, and the final webinar will be on something we've actually touched on today, which is screening. Um, so please do um, go to 
owenmitchell.com for all our updates and information on these webinars. Um, as I said, this uh, uh, webinar is going to be is recorded and will be circulated afterwards. Um, and please do let us know your feedback. Um, I believe there should be a link on your screen. So if you do have a couple of minutes, please do complete it. Um, so thanks again to um, Sonia and Pat uh, for joining us and uh, to everyone that's attended today.